and manage and train teams. For upper-level roles, you'll need on-the-job training in leadership and more than five years of experience. And certifications needed include ITIL, Six Sigma, and other relevant certifications related to your role. A career starting in technical support does not need to end in technical support. Experience within one area of the information technology field can be used in other areas of information technology. Some roles develop cross skills, meaning what you've learned and practiced in one role can be used in another role you're more interested in or more passionate about. Think about the required tasks you enjoy doing and look at other positions that require similar skills. Interview for roles that fit your strengths and require skills you wish to learn more about. You can also use your cross skills to advance to better roles that allow for more responsibilities and offer more pay and benefits. You can also level up your skills to help you reach higher level roles in technical support. Roles that are related to technical support that you could move into are network administrator, network security analyst, database administrator, cloud developer, QA engineer, and software developer. In this video, you learned that Career paths start at the entry-level technical support roles, move to mid-level roles, and then progress to upper-level roles. Technical support skills required for most roles are setting up and managing computers and devices, testing and researching new hardware and software, managing issues in projects, working with teams and clients, and troubleshooting and resolving technology-related issues. You can develop your cross skills to move to other roles you're more passionate about. And you can level up your skills to move up to more opportunities in the IT field. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss areas of tech support and how they found their niche. What career paths were available to you as a technical support professional, and how did you find your niche? For me, I had a background in databases and working with databases. So the field in technical support that I chose was become a um, level two specialist for a database product. And um, so it, you know, I was able to leverage my prior background and skills and at the same time grow in technical support by developing some interpersonal and customer support skills. After I graduated, um, I ended up getting just a basic call center job doing tech support for Subway. And for the most part, I ended up really liking a lot of what I was doing, stuff like that. And so when I moved out here to Bellevue, I tried to jump really hard into it. And I ended up getting a job at a nonprofit where I started out as a low tier, just IT technician. I would help the people in the company. It was great. But over time, I was there for almost six years and it ended up being just a, I did everything. And so I took over like the servers. I would run specific programs. I was our net sec uh, or security person. Um, I would go to different sites to install hardware and basically just kind of did everything. And so at this point, um, I moved over here to Facebook and it's been great doing a lot more of that stuff. And I interact with customers a lot and I still do all the hardware and stuff too. So I started my uh, career in technical support as a contractor working at a help desk for a really large credit card company in the United States. And I stayed there for a couple years, you know, learning how everything worked. And after a couple of years, I decided to broaden my you know, horizons. And so I applied for and, and accepted a position at a company that specializes in virtualization and virtual server clusters and, and things like that. And um, I found it fascinating. You know, I stayed there for seven years and, uh, you know, um, increased my, uh, my skill set and so forth. And then I made another move to another technology company that manufactures laptops and desktop computers and servers and so forth. And I worked as a, a tier three tech support engineer for that company for one year and then was recruited into a technical training position for their enterprise customers, which I did for about 10 years. And that was really fascinating. You know, I, I really... Uh, 
I enjoyed doing that. And then um, I left that company and uh, went to work for a company that manufactured storage um, as an enterprise or tier three uh, senior technical support engineer. And so that's a little bit about my journey in uh, my career as a technical support engineer. Welcome to Industry Certifications for Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to define technical support industry certifications, describe the benefits of technical support certifications, and identify industry-specific certifications. Okay, so what are industry certifications? They are awarded after a person passes an exam that certifies he or she meets industry standards for skills and knowledge. Certifications prove that an individual has learned strategies and concepts that are essential in the technical support field. Certifications also validate an individual's knowledge about information technology, or IT. They also certify that the individual has the skills required. And a certification shows that someone has a specialization in the field, even if he or she doesn't have on-the-job experience. Some benefits of certifications to you and your employer are more effective customer service. You will be able to troubleshoot more quickly and effectively because you have a broader understanding about various technologies and methods of working through problems. Increased productivity and resource management. You will be able to maintain your computer and understand more about security, networking, and software troubleshooting. And improved quality of support. You will be more familiar with common issues, customer situations, and ways to resolve those problems. For those interested in a career in technical support, a certification is a great way to get started. Some beginner-level certificates are available through CompTIA, Microsoft, Apple, the ITIL Foundation, and Cisco. So, if you want to work in technical support, the CompTIA IT Fundamentals, or ITF Plus certification, is one of the first certifications you should consider. It is for those who are trying to decide if an IT career is right for them, or for those who are just starting out. If you want to progress your career further in IT, CompTIA A Plus is the next certification you should consider. Getting your A-plus certification demonstrates that you've mastered hardware, software troubleshooting, networking, operating systems, device and network troubleshooting, security for devices and networks, mobile devices, virtualization and cloud computing, and operational procedures. Another certificate is the CompTIA Network Plus. If you're interested in the networking path, then getting the Network Plus certificate shows that you have the essential skills required for troubleshooting, configuring, and managing networks. Microsoft certifications, like Microsoft 365 Certified Fundamentals, is an introduction to Microsoft 365 and cloud services. Microsoft also offers role-based and specialty-based certifications and exams that professionals starting out their career can take to enhance their resume. The Apple Certified Support Professional, or ACSP, certification is for technical support and related IT roles for Mac users. The certificate shows that you understand Mac OS, can troubleshoot issues, and are able to support Mac users. Next, the ITIL Foundation certifications range from beginner levels to advanced levels, but you can start at a Support Center course and develop your skills in supporting customers, in IT role functions, and in troubleshooting methods. And the Cisco Certified Network Associate, or CCNA, certificate is for those wishing to further their knowledge of networking. The CCNA helps professionals highlight their skills in administering network maintenance, creating secure network access, and improving network connectivity. But you do not need to gain all of these certifications before starting in technical support. Begin by studying for just one of the certifications. Once you start in technical support, you can continue your learning by getting certified in more areas. And sometimes, employers are willing to offer some financial assistance or incentives to employees who wish to earn more certificates in their field. In an interview or at your job, 
be sure to ask what certification opportunities are available for you. In this video, you learned that certifications show that you have learned strategies and concepts that are essential in the technical support field. Some benefits of certifications are improvement in customer assistance, in productivity, and in support quality. Many beginner-level certifications are available through CompTIA, Cisco, Microsoft, Apple, the ITIL Foundation, and finally, certifications can be gained before you start in technical support and as you work in the field. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss skills critical for success in technical support. What skills are critical for success in technical support? I think the most important skill is patience. It's not always easy to explain over the phone what the client should be seeing and then interpret what they are seeing. They are often embarrassed at their lack of skill and you need to assure them that all is well and, and you'll help them work out all of the issues. Next is the ability to do problem determination and work out solutions. Proficiency in the technical domain is must, but apart from that, experience in the help desk software is which is needed. They should have strong problem solving skills plus interpersonal skills. Of course, they should be creative thinking thinker too. They must have previous experience in tech support or a similar job. A technical support executive should be very attentive towards the detail and, of course, a good team worker too. Although you can, be, you can become a technical support worker with any degree, employers prefer applicants to have an IT-related qualifications. But apart from that, I personally feel that a technical support executive must do the certifications in the domain they are into. For example, if somebody is security professional or data information security professional, they should have got the, so they should be certified with information system security profession, uh, certifications. The skills that I needed or that anyone needs to be a good technical support engineer or to be successful in a role as a, a technical support engineer, number one is listening. You have to listen to the customer. Listen to what they're saying, repeat it back to them so you have a solid understanding of the problem that they're trying to describe to you so you can take the appropriate steps to get it resolved. The second skill that you need is a soft skill, but not everyone has it, and that is patience. I always think that you can be taught the technical skill, but what you can't teach some people is solid customer support skills. You know, empathy, patience, you know, being a good listener, being able to, to listen to what they're saying, how to calm down an irate customer. Those are some of the things that are critical to being successful in technical support and enjoying your position and being really good at what you do. You can work with a customer. So like customer service skills um, are really fantastic because you got to be able to engage with the person, find out exactly what they're meaning because um, you'll meet very many different people of high skill, low skill. And so sometimes they'll give you a very generic thing of this doesn't work, fix it. And you have to ask the right questions to figure out exactly what they're asking, what's actually wrong. Welcome to Overview of Support Channels. After watching this video, you will be able to list various types of channels available to perform technical support, discuss factors that influence choice of support channels, and identify the most appropriate support channels for a given problem or scenario. All right, imagine it's 30 minutes before your assignment is due and you're ready to submit your file to your online course. However, you keep getting an error message you can't sign in. What do you do? Don't freak out yet. You have support channels that you can use to help resolve your issue. After troubleshooting a few things on your own, you try searching online and your school's website support pages. You've just used one of the channels of technical support. Support pages are designed for self-help, 
and you can often find information like FAQs, documentation about services or products, wikis, and a knowledge base. You can also browse discussion forums for posts from other users who have experienced similar problems. But for your problem, your school support pages make no mention of it. Hmm. Now, email is for issues that might not need immediate resolution. Usually, companies provide their email addresses for support on their websites or in product emails and documents sent to their customers. If you have a question or an issue that isn't time-sensitive, you can email support and they can respond to you when they get to your email in their queue. This is one kind of asynchronous support. Organizations can also provide asynchronous support on social media platforms like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. People who have an issue with a larger organization may choose to post on social media to get the company's attention. Public posts on social media allow customers to identify or tag the company and share their issue. Social media allows an asynchronous interaction between customers and companies. Customers can have their issues resolved, and companies can show they care about supporting their product. Now, phone support is synchronous, meaning the support happens live and in real time. It's good for those with urgent issues, like they can't submit their assignment online. Phone support is also for those who need to discuss sensitive information, like details about finances or health. And the phone is ideal for customers who prefer live, real-time conversations with someone who can assist them with their technical issue. Live chat also gives you access to technical support in real-time through an app on a device or through a website. Through live chat, technical support can walk you through your issue to resolution. And some live chat tools will even indicate where you are on the company's website, so support can better assist you. If your device or hardware is the problem, video chat is helpful because it allows technical support to see what you are seeing. You can show the support person through video chat the steps you are taking to sign in to your college's website. Video chat can also be helpful if you have a hardware issue. Say, if you have a problem with your printer not working, you can show through video chat what's going on. Video chat can provide virtual hands-on help. And remote support is another form of synchronous support. Using remote software, a host device for technical support connects to a customer's device. Both need to be connected to a program for remote support, and both need to be connected to the internet to connect remotely. Remote support is also helpful if there is a setting on your device, or if an update is needed, and you need someone else to make those changes on your computer for you. And when all else fails, you can always use in-person support. This is when you need hands-on troubleshooting, preventative maintenance services, and hardware-related support. So, now you're down to only 15 minutes until your paper is due. This is urgent, so you decide to call the technical support phone number. After only a few minutes of chatting with someone on the phone, you discover the problem. The site hosting your online course was offline, but it's back up again. Your issue is now resolved, and you are able to log in and submit your assignment. Congratulations! You probably didn't realize that a lot was going on with your school's technical support while you were trying to submit your assignment. Before you realized you couldn't sign in, another user encountered the same issue and connected to technical support through one of the school's many support channels. Once technical support was notified, a ticket was created and support began working through the issue. Ticketing systems are also essential support tools and they document, track, and manage customer issues to resolution. Organizations can convert incoming emails into tickets, log phone sessions like yours, or provide an interface where users can submit tickets directly. For your issue, the organization used internal support channels to identify and resolve the issue. All of this is so the school's many students can submit their assignments on time. But you're not the only one who has benefited from having many different support channels available. A Zen Desk survey of its customers found the following. 
Four simple service requests. Customers surveyed preferred email over phone support, live chat, SMS text, and social media. But for complicated service requests, more of the customers surveyed preferred phone over live chat, email, SMS text, and social media. The results show that customers use a broad mix of channels to contact customer support. In this video, you learned that businesses and organizations often need to provide multiple support channels to address different problems and customer needs. Technical support can be provided through many channels using self-help, synchronous, and asynchronous tools. Ticketing systems are support tools that document, track, and manage customer issues to resolution. And customers use a broad mix of channels to contact customer support. Welcome to Remote Support Tools. After watching this video, you will be able to define remote support tools, identify the types of remote support, and discuss features and benefits of using remote support. Remote support software in technical support is a tool that allows technical support to access and control another computer that is in another location. Remote support software enables technical support to troubleshoot, install software, and provide instant support remotely. Why is remote support necessary? It can save a lot of time for both a customer and technical support. Instead of spending a lot of time with emails and trying to determine what a user's issue is, a remote support technician can access a user's computer and identify problems faster, which means that issues are resolved sooner. Remote support also means that technical support is available immediately when customers need help. Some common issues that technical support resolves using remote tools are connectivity or software issues with email, internet, Wi-Fi, and virtual private network or VPN connections, slow computer operations, printer connections, necessary programs that are not working correctly or not at all, video conferencing issues, and security issues including unwanted adware and malware. There are two main types of remote support, attended and unattended. Attended remote support is when a customer is at a device and needs support. The problem needs to be solved as soon as possible. Attended support allows for hands-on support. This expedites resolution times and increases customer satisfaction. Now, unattended remote support is for maintenance support of groups of users and servers. The software does not require permission from users to access their computers, and users do not need to be at their computers for support to provide maintenance and support devices. Unattended remote support is ideal for installing updates, managing the IT infrastructure, and troubleshooting issues on many devices. So, how does remote support software work? Remote support needs two devices, a host device for technical support and a customer device. Both need to be connected to a program for remote support and both need to be connected to the internet in order to connect remotely. Technical support shares a passcode or identifier to the customer who will then enter the code in the application on their device. This grants technical support access to be in control of the customer's display, pointer, and all functions. Technical support can install and uninstall programs, modify settings, and troubleshoot issues. Some examples of commonly used remote software are ConnectWise, TeamViewer, Dameware, Beyond Trust, and Zoho Assist. And some applications, like Windows Remote Assistance, come pre-installed with the computer's operating system. Some common features and benefits of remote support tools include the following. With remote control and screen sharing, technical support can remotely view and fully control a user's computer. File sharing is a feature that allows technical support to resolve issues that relate to bad files on a user's device. File sharing through remote support ensures that files are kept secure, which keeps the user's device secure. Technical support can also transfer support sessions to another person in technical support if the first technician is unable to resolve an issue. And multiple monitor navigation and support allows technical support to view and navigate multiple screens and monitors for customers. In this video, you learned that 
Remote support software allows technical support to access, control, and provide support to another computer. Attended remote support software is used by technical support when a customer is at a device. Unattended remote support does not require users to be at their computers. And some features of remote support software are remote control, file sharing, transfer support sessions, and multiple monitor support. In this video, technical support professionals will discuss how they provide remote support to clients. What are some steps you go through when preparing to remote into a client's computer, and how do you prepare them and talk them through the steps you're taking to help solve their issues? So here at Meta, the main thing we do as that is we connect in a lot of the time. Um, we're moving away from the way we interact with people on a certain level, but basically we try to let them know like, hey, is it all right if we share your screen? And for some places, it's not as easy, but we can just click a button after they say yes, and we just kind of take over, and they, they're happy with it. At previous places, it's we have to request an entire number to enter in the system to remotely connect. And typically, we will uh, want to ask them, to like, hey, close anything you don't want me to see, I, and then I will take over. Gaining remote access into a customer system can be very difficult at times. Um, you know, sometimes they're calling, they're just looking for a quick answer, a quick fix, and they think that uh, getting into a remote session is just going to prolong you know, their call and they don't have time to do that. Um, oftentimes, too, it depends on who the customer is. You know, if it's somebody, you know, if your company is making products that are consumed by, you know, other companies and you're used to dealing with folks that work in IT, um, it's a lot easier because they understand remote access and are often uh, quick to allow you into their system because they know that they can get their resolution potentially that much faster. But if it's, um, you know, let's say it's a consumer product, uh, you know, it's a USB drive or, you know, replacing a hard drive or a camera that they purchased and it's it's not connecting to their laptop, they can be really hesitant um, to allow you to connect to their machine, which is completely understandable. They may have things like their tax returns stored on there or other sensitive types of information. And they also seem to think that after we hang up the call that somehow magically we can just get back into their machine when, whenever we want to. So the first thing that you want to do is allay any fears that you know your customer might have with you know a remote uh, connection. You want to explain to them why you're, you know, you would like to access their machine remotely and how much time it could save them and that they'll be able to see everything that you're doing while the remote session is in progress and that you won't do anything without their permission. So if you're patient and you gently explain these, to, uh, these things to them, you'll probably have a better experience. Remote uh, technical support is both a, um, a great benefit um, as well as it can be, um, it can be pressurizing for the agents. Um, it can be helpful because a lot of times you're trying to walk um, um, a customer into a particular, you know, walk through a particular solution, and they might be doing something different from what you're telling them. So being able to try things out yourself uh, makes it a lot easier uh, with access to uh, the desktop. Uh, but at the same time, the customer is watching you do certain things. So you need to uh, be good at what you're doing. You need to really understand and make sure you have good skills in, uh, in the system or the application that you're trying to um, debug or resolve the problem for remotely. Welcome to Levels of Technical Support. After watching this video, you will be able to describe the need for tiered support, recognize the different levels of technical support, and identify support procedures and skills required at each level. What is the need for tiered or leveled support? Having tiered support has the following advantages. Strategically route issues to different levels of support based on the product, issue complexity, and severity. Having a timeline and protocol for solving issues helps the organization as it grows. 
For a growing organization, tiered support helps handle a large volume of issues effectively by using resources appropriately. Customer satisfaction is improved by reducing their wait time. And tiered support provides an opportunity for training tech support professionals and gives them a chance to broaden their skill sets. There are five levels of technical support, ranging from levels 0 to 4. Level 0 support is the self-service level where users can find help with FAQs or a knowledge base. Level 1 support is usually basic help desk service. Level 2 support is more in-depth troubleshooting of issues. Level 3 support includes support specialists and skilled engineers. And Level 4 is support provided by third-party businesses that might supply some parts of the components that are not directly supported by the organization. Let's look at the levels a little closer. Level 0 contains self-service support, like FAQs on a web page or product documentation that users can retrieve online for themselves. It also includes chatbots for simple queries, discussion forums for help from other users, and knowledge bases for support. The next level is Level 1 support, which includes help desk. Common issues may involve support helping users navigate new applications and menus. Using phone, email, or social media support, Level 1 generally involves basic user and password issues, hardware and software installation, and setup issues. If unable to address the issues, Level 1 support escalates the issue to Level 2. Level 2 support deals with harder and more specific tasks than Level 1. They review the steps documented by Level 1 technicians and start troubleshooting issues escalated to them. They have in-depth product knowledge, technical skills, and excellent communication skills to help resolve issues and communicate the same to customers. If an issue isn't resolved by them, customers are escalated to the Level 3 support tier. Next is Level 3 support. Level 3 technicians are skilled specialists and analysts with a wide range of experience and wide access to resources needed to recreate the issue in a lab environment. The technicians attempt to determine the root cause of the issue, and this may lead to product changes and solutions passed down to Level 1 and 2 technicians. And the last level of support is Level 4 support, though it exists outside the organization. It includes contracted support for products sourced from other manufacturers. This may consist of support for printers, computers, software, machine maintenance, and other outsourced hardware and software. Level 3 or Level 2 support may forward some queries for review by Level 4 support. Now, IT support levels usually describe the skills and access levels the IT support personnel have. This table shows the skills required at each support level. At level 0, users can browse and retrieve support information from the web or app-based platforms including product details, FAQs, technical information, manuals, and search functions. Level 1 requires staff to have a basic level of technical knowledge. They are trained to resolve known problems and fulfill service requests by following documented standard operating procedures, SOP, or scripts. Level 2 requires support personnel having deep knowledge and a good understanding of the product or service. They may or may not be the programmers or engineers who designed and created the service or product, but they should have adequate knowledge and experience of the specified product or service. At Level 3, subject matter experts, or SMEs, and specialists typically have the highest level of skills and are often called product specialists. This group must have experience in solving complex problems and may include the actual creators, engineers, programmers, or chief architects who designed and developed the product or service. And the final level, that is, Level 4, prefers suppliers and business partners providing support and services for products or components that are not directly supported by an organization, but are essential for customer service. In this video, you learned that tiered support is needed to route technical support issues correctly based on product complexity and severity, and to improve technical support training and upskilling opportunities for tech support professionals.
tech support levels range from 0 to 4, of which levels 1, 2, and 3 are the main levels of tech support. And level 0 is a self-service tool for customers, while level 4 is usually provided from outside the company. Welcome to Service Level Agreements, or SLAs. After watching this video, you will be able to define service level agreements, or SLAs, in technical support, discuss the key differences between response and resolution SLAs, and identify how priority levels with SLAs are interconnected. So, what are service level agreements, or SLAs, in technical support? SLAs are legal agreements or contracts between businesses and customers. SLAs ensure quality, timeliness, and availability of technical support. They enable businesses to manage and meet customer expectations. And they can be time-based, especially in technical support, when a customer might need rapid resolution to an issue. Okay, imagine this scenario. You downloaded and installed free software for an ebook reader. You find on the FAQ page for the company some information about the help offered by their team if you run into problems using the software. They also detail how to contact them. Additionally, they state how fast their support can handle your queries based on whether you are using the free version of the software or the paid version. So, when you installed and used their software, you accepted their contract and agreed to the business's SLA. SLA contracts will include the following. An agreement summary with definitions, SLA measurements, and metrics used. Goals of the business and users. For example, what needs does the user have that the business can provide? Consequences of violations like financial penalties or incentives, so the business and the customer can continue to work together. And point of contact, so customers know who is involved, what their roles are, and the escalation of issues. There are three types of SLAs. Customer-based SLAs, which are customized for different customers. Service-based SLAs are for groups of customers who use a service the same. Every customer receives the same service and multiple SLAs for different types of customers like premium or VIP allow for variation within the SLA to meet different needs for different parts of a business. But how are SLAs and priority levels interconnected? SLA priority levels can be adjusted based on the impact that the issue has on the business. The higher the impact is on the business, then the more urgent the priority is. In the example shown here, Level 1 has a high priority and high impact. The issue has most likely resulted in stopping business. Level 2 means the business has been disrupted. Level 3 priority indicates that maybe the issue is an inconvenience for customers, but it doesn't stop the business from operating. And Level 4 is the lowest priority level in this example. It might represent routine services like updates or changes. SLAs will also include details about how long support has to respond to issues and resolve issues. Response times are how long technical support teams have to acknowledge and start work on an issue. For example, a low-priority issue may have a response goal of two business days. However, an urgent issue that extensively impacts business may have an immediate response goal. Resolution SLAs state how long the team has to resolve the issue from start to finish. Resolution SLAs might also have priority levels, but the time to resolve the issue may be different from response SLAs. Whatever your role is in technical support, you will most likely be using some form of ticketing system to manage SLAs. Ticketing systems will help you track, monitor, prioritize, automate, and report on SLAs for your organization. In this video, you learned that ticketing systems help you and your organization manage SLAs. SLAs are legal agreements between businesses and their customers that ensure quality, timeliness, and availability of technical support. SLAs identify priority levels depending on the urgency of issues 
and establish response and resolution times. And finally, three types of SLAs are customer-based, service-based, and multiple SLAs, which can be a combination of customer and service-based SLAs. Service level agreements, or SLAs, are undeniably a huge part of technical support. What are SLAs? Why are meeting these contractual obligations important to the success of a tech support professional? So another important uh, tip is that you should always implement SLA or service level agreements. So most of today's ticketing software system comes equipped with service level agreements, tracking and management capabilities. SLAs lay out an agreement between you and your customers. This function defines a response and resolution time times customer can expect. Moreover, it helps agent to deliver service targets. Setting SLAs ensures that your customer service team answers each ticket request. Therefore, handled within a reasonable time frame so customer never waits for too long. The SLAs are important because not only they set an expectation for the customer on when they can expect a response or an issue to be addressed on, in, uh, but also it helps the support team prioritize their workload and resources. So um, a service level agreement is sort of an agreement with uh, typically with contract stuff, um, but basically it's that you are going to um, it's with like a ticketing system. So people will uh, report that they have an issue, it, they create a ticket, it goes to you. Now there's different uh, categories. So there's a low, medium, and high priority. Typically the higher priority means you have will have to answer and respond to the issue within a certain amount of time. And so lower tier um, will end up having a much higher opening. So it'd be like six hours versus 15 minutes of both response time and sometimes fixing the entire issue. There was a time in when I was working in tech support where our level one team was short staffed and there was a risk that we might not meet our severity one SLA of um, response within one hour. So several us, of us from level two were asked to help out and um, uh, you know, on and go on to the help desk to help address any urgent issues, severity one issues that might be coming in. Welcome to the Escalation Matrix. After watching this video, you will be able to identify escalation and its types, discuss the escalation matrix, and describe handoffs and their importance. Imagine you just received your new printer and you're excited to try it out, but it isn't connecting to your computer. You need help, so you immediately contact the company's technical support line. After trying a few things and not resolving the issue, support tells you they will need to escalate your case. But what does that mean? An escalation in technical support is when the first support person you contact is unable to offer an answer or solution to the problem. You must be transferred to the next point of contact in support. When an issue is escalated, it moves through the levels of support until it reaches resolution. So why do companies need escalation? Escalation is an effective method of building trust and support for an organization. It allows better communication between the organization and its customers. Escalation improves businesses because issues and problems can be identified and fixed. And escalation boosts customer satisfaction when an organization supports its products. Now, whether the escalation process goes through a service desk, through product engineers, or automatically through a tracking system, there are typically three paths escalation policies follow. Functional escalation, hierarchical escalation, and automatic escalation. Functional escalation is when an issue is escalated to a team or person with the skills and knowledge to resolve the issue, not the person with the most seniority. For example, 
the first person to respond to the issue may be a senior developer from one team who isn't familiar with the problem. The incident then gets escalated to a junior developer on another team who has more knowledge of the issue. Through the functional escalation process, the issue gets identified and corrected more quickly. The second path is hierarchical escalation. When an issue does not have a clear path to resolution, support may escalate the issue until the customer is satisfied with the resolution, even if it's not the outcome they wanted. The issue is escalated through the support hierarchy. For example, the issue might start with a service desk technician, then be escalated to the team lead or manager, and then is escalated to a supervisor or a specialist. And the final path is automatic escalation. Ticketing systems can automatically escalate an incident. If, after the issue has been submitted, the primary on-call person doesn't respond in time to the ticket or another similar issue occurs, the issue is automatically escalated to another level of support, like another person in support or even a chatbot. So what is an escalation matrix? An escalation matrix is made up of a series of increasing levels based on severity and priority. It includes whom to contact based on the specific problem the customer is experiencing. What an escalation matrix looks like and how it's used varies depending on the company. This is an example of one type. Typically, the escalation matrix will include contact information for support and what the contact's role is. It also states the timing of when issues should be escalated to the next level. Sometimes the technical support person you were talking to transfers you to someone else to resolve your issue. This is called a handoff. Handoffs are important because they help support teams resolve an issue. Additionally, they encourage support teams to share knowledge with each other. They prevent incomplete documentation about problems and fixes. And handoffs can lead to faster and more satisfactory resolution of issues. Okay, back to that scenario with your new printer. You've turned it on and off and checked all the cables, but it still isn't connecting to your computer, so you contact technical support. A first-level representative walks you through basic troubleshooting steps with no resolution. Your issue is escalated to a level 2 technician who is more familiar with your printer. After more troubleshooting, the level 2 technician mentions a possible software issue. The level 2 technician hands off your issue to a level 3 software engineer. You answer a few questions, and the software engineer suggests, of course, a software fix. And the fix is a success, and finally your printer is working properly. So, using the escalation matrix, technical support has resolved the problem. In this video, you learned that an escalation in technical support is when one support person is unable to offer an answer or solution to the problem and transfers the issue to a higher level for support. Three paths followed by escalation policies are functional, hierarchical, and automatic escalation. An escalation matrix is made up of a series of increasing levels of support based on severity and priority. And a handoff is when one support person transfers an issue to another person to resolve the issue. Welcome to What Are Ticketing Systems? After watching this video, you will be able to indicate what a ticketing system is and what it's used for, Describe how ticketing systems work, and identify the use of ticketing systems by IT professionals. A support ticket is an electronic document used to record the interaction between a customer and a service representative. It contains a record of communications and resolution efforts for a particular problem and is useful to manage issues, questions, requests, and problems your customers might have. A ticket may also be referred to using terms like issue, case, or incident. A support ticket is managed using a ticketing system. These systems may also be called help desk software, customer support software, ticketing software or app, and case management system or customer care management system. What is a ticketing system? 
A ticketing system is software used to systematically document, track, manage, and resolve customer issues. Functionally, a ticketing system facilitates the creation of tickets, allowing support agents to manage, collaborate, and coordinate resolution efforts. A ticketing system contains a central data hub designed to streamline communications between agents, team members, and customers. Most ticketing systems, in addition to basic ticket management, also provide the following capabilities. Some automation. For example, the routing of a web ticket to an appropriate resource. Collaboration, allowing all agents and resources to freely access information to increase efficiency. Easy integration with other or future IT management processes and applications. Multiple channels of customer access, such as by telephone or online forms and reporting system performance of metrics, such as response time, volume, and customer satisfaction. Here is a typical life cycle of a ticket. The ticket is created when a customer walks in, calls an agent, enters relevant information in an online form, sends an email to a customer support email address, or posts on social media. The ticket is assigned to a customer support agent, or a queue, monitored by multiple agents. This agent categorizes the ticket and assesses priority and severity. The ticket is resolved by the resource, which may include validation, requests for further information, or escalation. And finally, once the issue is resolved, the ticket is closed by the agent or customer. However, if needed, the ticket can always be reopened. Tickets can be created from the customer online or using an app, as shown here, the customer's use of a text session, such as an SMS or email, to contact the support agent, or a link in social media to contact the support agent. Initially, tickets contain basic information, such as the customer's name, the date of the request, the email address used to contact the customer, the category of the problem, and a brief description of the issue. Also, maybe some additional relevant details, such as a model number. The ticketing system may automatically assign a ticket to a specific agent based on some business rules or logic, like the time of day, who the customer is, problem category, agent availability, etc., or may be placed in a queue from which available agents can pick a ticket and assign it to themselves. In some cases, a supervisor may assign the tickets in a queue to specific agents manually. As the agent receiving the request, you open the ticket. Note that if an online source is used, the provided information automatically appears in the ticket. In the case of a phone call, you would obtain and enter this information yourself. Also note that each ticket will be assigned a ticket number. This number will identify this ticket through its life cycle. The agent working on the ticket communicates with the customer to resolve the issue. When reviewing the information provided, you, in some cases, may be allowed to reassign or forward it to a specialist or to a more appropriate queue. As part of this process, you may require additional details to troubleshoot the issue. For example, you may get into a live chat session with the customer. You verify the issue and instruct the customer how to resolve the problem. Once the issue is resolved, you close the ticket and change the status in the system. In this video, you learned that a ticketing system is software used to systematically manage and resolve customer issues. The life cycle of a ticket includes ticket creation, assigning and starting the ticket issue, resolving the ticket issue, and closing the ticket. And IT support agents create tickets, start the ticket process, and resolve issues using a variety of communication methods. Welcome to Insider's Viewpoints, Handling Difficult Situations. In this video, you will hear a technical support professional describe a real-world difficult situation and what strategies she uses to approach the problem. 
Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm an instructional designer for SkillUp Technologies. But prior to joining SkillUp, I spent over 20 years of my career working as a Tier 3 technical support engineer for various different companies. So I became an expert at handling difficult situations and difficult customers alike, ranging from home users using retail products all the way up to Fortune 500 and Global 1000 customers too. So I'm here to share with you today a real-world example of a case I handled while working at one of my previous employers. We had an enterprise-level customer purchase several dozen very expensive enterprise-class products for use in his organization. However, after a period of time, they began failing one by one until eventually they all failed. So our customer reached out to us um, and filed a support ticket for technical assistance. However, due to various reasons, that ticket remained in a queue untouched for over seven months. Now, during that seven months, his organization experienced weeks of downtime. Um, and they also had to go out and purchase several dozen more very expensive enterprise class products from one of our competitors to get their division operational again. So our inability or our failure to handle his case correctly resulted in a significant financial loss for his company, and he wanted to know what we plan to do about it. So not only was it a very difficult situation, um, it was also a very delicate one and one that required me to walk a very fine line to try to get it resolved, which ultimately I did. So sometimes folks ask me, you know, Michelle, how do you remain calm in situations like these? And how do you calm a customer down when they're calling you and they're very upset? So not much, really. I take a deep breath and I try not to let the situation impact my senses or my emotions. I try not to get caught up in the moment emotionally along with the customer. And that helps keep things calm. Um, I know that angry customers aren't mad at me personally, so I try not to take things, you know, personally, ever. Um, they're mad at what happened to them. They're mad at the situation, and they want somebody to help them to get it resolved. And, you know, further to that, they may be experiencing additional pressure coming at them from, you know, their daily lives, or perhaps it's pressure coming from upper management and breathing down this person's neck, you know, regarding the case for which they're calling you about, Right. So when I try to diffuse a situation like this, the first thing I do is let the customer speak. No matter how well versed I am with the history of the case, I let the customer get everything off their chest because I have learned to realize that this is the first step in calming down the customer. Right? I speak in a very calm and reassuring and very respectful tone, using affirmations to let that customer know that I am paying attention and that I am listening to everything that they have to say. Right. And I think the second most important thing for de-escalating or defusing an issue like this is gaining the customer's trust. If you can gain their trust and instill in them the confidence that you're the one that's ultimately going to resolve their issue, that is very helpful towards de-escalation and getting the case moving in a forward direction. Um, you know, you may not be able to resolve the issue, you know, in terms of fixing things that are broken, but you may be able to take a very negative situation and turn it around so it will have a positive outcome. Okay. Some folks ask me, how do I get in the right mindset for handling difficult situations? So I always ask myself two questions. The first one is, does the customer have a legitimate reason for being this angry towards me. And so, um, you know, if the answer is yes, then what that does is it raises my level of empathy towards the customer, which they can hear in my voice, which helps de-escalate the situation. And the second thing that I do to prepare is I ask myself, is the, is the, is the customer being unrealistic in the amount of anger that they're, you know, displaying in this particular call? Because the truth about working in technical support is there are customers that will do that. They know that if they yell in the right ears for the right amount of time, they may walk away with something free or an appeasement item. And then, you know, by the same token, sometimes you get folks who are just abusive. You know, that's their nature. That's their personality. And no matter what you do, they're going to hang up that phone just as angry as they were when they called you in the first place. So let me leave you with some final tips if you're considering a career in technical support. And firstly, that's to remember that 
a difficult call is not the end of the world, whether you had a hand in it or not. Um, if you've done the best that you can, you've done a good job. You've done all you can do. And the only thing that you can do is get through it, you know, the best that you can. And um, also remember that difficult situations don't last forever and that they can also be a very valuable learning experience, you know, as it was for our company. Um, accept the fact that difficult situations and difficult customers come with the territory. It's part of working in the technical support industry. And finally, you know, remember that time and experience will give you all the skills that you need to be able to su successfully handle difficult situations and difficult customers, just like it has for me. So I wish you all the best in your career as a technical support engineer, and I hope that this information was helpful to you. Thank you. Welcome to features and benefits of ticketing systems. After watching this video, you will be able to define common features of ticketing systems, describe how tickets are tagged and routed, and describe how automation is critical in a ticketing system. Comprehensive IT ticketing tools can include a number of features. Common features of ticketing systems include omni-channel support, the ability to generate tickets from different channels, ticket routing, the ability to assign tickets to agents or departments, ticket categorization, and tagging, where the ticket can be classified and sorted by issue to enable routing to a particular specialist, tracking and management, where the ticket contains a processing trail, knowledge base management, where issues solved in past tickets can be used as a resource for addressing similar new tickets, and automation, the ability of the system to automatically perform tasks like route tickets, send emails, or create alerts. Customers can contact your help desk organization from many channels, email, social media, live chat, and phone. Many times, the resolution of a ticket can involve more than one channel, so consolidation of these communications in one place is important. This preserves issue specifics, customer conversations, and customer profiles in one ticket document. Requests can come from different sources and are collected in the ticketing system. John has a problem with a network setting. John calls and talks with the support agent who creates the ticket. Sarah emails customer support with a printer issue. A support agent receives the request and enters it into the ticketing system. And Marvin texts with a problem downloading software. A support agent receives the message and collects specific information about the problem. All these requests are consolidated into a common dashboard where agents can collaborate with team members all in one place. A ticketing system has specific capabilities to manage the life cycle of the ticket. Tickets can be categorized based on date, ticket type, customer, and issue specifics. Tickets are then tagged with this information. This becomes part of the ticket and may trigger automatic processes such as routing and customer communication. Based on categorization, tickets are then routed to the appropriate agent. For example, if one agent is more knowledgeable about IBM authoring, the ticket is routed to that person. But if the agent that first receives the ticket can resolve the issue, they work to do so. As the ticket is worked, all customer and internal communication and other notes about the process resolution are captured by the ticket system. This will provide information about ticket status, which can be reviewed by agents or rolled up into a daily report. A well-organized ticket system can help provide good customer service by resolving issues quickly with minimum customer back and forth. As a ticket contains information about its management through the system, tracking the history of the ticket is as easy as looking at the ticket itself. A key for constant system improvement relies on analytics. The ticketing system provides analytics for the organization to see how the tickets are spread out. For example, by alert level, by ticket status, or by the group requesting the help desk support. 
with the ability to aggregate and report ticket information. You can also investigate what works and areas of improvement in process improvement, performance metrics, and resource management. Many customers are fully capable of serving themselves and may prefer to do so if that option is available to them. A knowledge base system allows customers and agents to research issues. Knowledge base systems help customers by summarizing and storing large amounts of information in searchable linked databases. Knowledge bases can also assist agents to find resources for customers. And knowledge bases require updates to keep content relevant. Knowledge base access can include questions to agents through messaging or chat, searching for answers to common questions without direct agent support, discussion groups for specific products or process types, and product documentation and demonstrations. Automation is a critical part of a ticketing system. It helps tickets get to the right person at the right time. The logistics of managing tickets can get complicated quickly. Automation can help in assigning tickets, sending responses to customers and team members, escalating issues based on severity, and pulling customer data to address specific needs. Automation reduces time spent on repetitive tasks and media work, making agents more engaged and productive. In this video, you learned that common features of help desk ticketing systems include omni-channel support, ticket routing, tagging, and automation. Ticketing systems knowledge bases contain large amounts of information and can be accessed by customers or help desk agents during issue resolution. And automation can manage ticket flow and reduce time spent on repetitive tasks. Welcome to Popular Ticketing Systems. After watching this video, you will be able to indicate what to look for in a ticketing system, describe types of ticketing systems, and list popular ticketing systems. What should companies look for in a ticketing system? The system should be straightforward to use to make the most of an agent's time, enrich the quality of customer interactions by providing customer information and history in the system. Be available to provide reportable metrics you can use to evaluate customer service performance. Provide tools for agents and managers to identify repeated problematic issues. And enable and foster internal team collaboration. Hosting types of ticketing systems include cloud-based systems, which are hosted on a vendor server, and self-hosted systems, which is licensed software that runs on your company's server. Licensing types include open source systems, which are basic code that is easily modified by your developers, and enterprise systems, which are generally used by large companies and offer many advanced features. Cloud-based systems are hosted on a vendor server, and the benefits are setting up and maintaining the system is easy as the vendor does most of the work. They are highly scalable, the vendor handles the required growth. And cloud-based systems are also available to anyone connected to the Internet. Concerns about cloud-based systems include the following. You must rely on the vendor to address malfunctions or bugs. An Internet connection is always required. And customization is limited and must be performed by the vendor. A self-hosted system is licensed software that runs on your company's server. The benefits include complete control of data and security, and in running your own instance of the software, it can be more flexible to meet business needs. The 